Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to this recorded version of the Delivering Feedback Remotely workshop. My name is Joel Beaupre. I'm a teaching and learning consultant at Conestoga College, and I will be taking you through and narrating this workshop, which we would normally facilitate live as part of our Assessing Student Learning in a Remote Environment series. But today I'm going to be recording it for YouTube um, so that you can access it a little bit sooner. Um, so this is going to be an abridged version of the workshop. Obviously, we're not going to do any interactive activities, um, but hopefully it will share some timely content for you as you continue to prepare for remote teaching here in the current spring semester and in preparation for the fall semester as well. If you're interested in participating in the full live version of this workshop or any others in this series or any of the workshops that we offer through teaching and learning, Remember, you can always go to our page, conestogac.on.ca slash teaching and learning slash faculty orientation. And there you will find drop down menus with up to date schedules for our orientation workshops and our non orientation workshops. And this series will be offered a couple times again in August of 2020. So I hope to see you at one of the live sessions. All right, with all that being said, let's go forward. So generally, when we do this workshop live, we start with a reflection. And I'm gonna invite you just to do this independently right now. Think of a truly memorable and impactful piece of feedback that you've received in the past. Who shared it? What did they say? Was the feedback positive or negative? Was the feedback expected? Now, based on that reflection, and remember at any point in time, if I prompt you during this video, feel free to pause the video and take notes and, and think about you know, some of the different applications that I'm sharing with you. But my point with this particular reflection is to think about what makes feedback meaningful and memorable. Now, as you were reflecting on that feedback that you've received in the past, maybe you found it memorable because you respected the source of the feedback. Maybe it was really positive and it's something that stayed with you. Maybe it was applicable and there was something in that feedback that caused you to change a particular practice or change something about yourself. On the other hand, maybe the feedback was memorable because it was negative. Maybe the language was terse. It came in a way that was unexpected or inappropriate. Maybe you didn't necessarily have a strong relationship with the person who provided it. These are all important things to take into consideration when we think about how to deliver feedback to our students. We want our students to know that our feedback is coming from a place of caring um, and a place of interest in supporting their learning, right? And feedback is such an essential part of learning. That's why we're having this session. That's why it's part of the series. And that's why we've got to ensure that even in a remote environment, when connections are difficult and communication can be strained, it really is essential that students receive your feedback appropriately, positively, and most importantly, they're able to apply it to their learning because that's what really counts. All right, so we're going to go forward now and talk a little bit more about, firstly, the outcomes of this particular session. In this workshop, I'm going to facilitate some opportunities for you to reflect on the purposes and practices for providing feedback. I'm also going to invite you to consider the ways that these practices can and should be adjusted when delivering feedback in a remote environment. Lastly, we'll identify some specific strategies and tools, some technical, some not so much, to help close the feedback loop for learning. And if you've never heard that expression, the feedback loop before, we'll define that as well. Take a moment now to ask yourself, how would I normally deliver formative feedback to my students? So without thinking specifically about the remote or online environment, if you were in a face-to-face -face classroom, how would you typically get formative feedback to your students? And remember, when I say formative, I mean that feedback which is for learning, all right? So formative feedback isn't necessarily linked to a high stakes or summative assessment. It is feedback that is associated with maybe a low stakes or no stakes assessment for the purpose of giving some students or giving students some insight into where they're at and what they can change in order to improve, improve their performance going forward. How do you normally connect and communicate that kind of feedback with students? Well, I've asked this question to some different groups of faculty in the live versions of these sessions. And what they've said are things like what you're seeing on the screen now by email, 
that's a nice private and direct way to communicate with students, regardless of whether we're teaching in a live or a remote environment. We might also use online polling tools like Mentimeter and Kahoot. These can be used as review activities and they give students a sense as to whether or not they are effectively retaining and comprehending the content that's being presented in class. So that too is a form of feedback. We might be using our evaluation tools, checklists, marking schemes, rubrics, whatever they may be. Sometimes in the live environment, they might be provided on paper. Often they're provided on Econostoga, regardless of the delivery format. And that too may be a great place to provide some qualitative commentary on how students are doing. Some faculty also use one-on-one -on -one sessions, it might be during their office hours or by appointment or, you know, using a tool like Zoom to connect with students. And then many faculty like to use notes and markups within assignments themselves. So a student has submitted something, whether it's for grades or whether it's for feedback, many faculty like to add comments directly on the page, whether it's in a physical format or a digital format to get feedback to students. So these are all tried and true means of getting feedback to students, but are they applicable to the remote environment? Some may be, others maybe not. By the end of the session, it's gonna be our objective to build on this list of possibilities on how to connect with students when delivering feedback remotely. So we'll come back to this list a little bit later. Before we get to any other activities, I wanna talk just in general terms though about things like the feedback loop. What does that mean? This is a term that has different definitions in different contexts. So I'm not talking about the feedback loop that occurs in audio engineering or in you know, a, a more um, health science context. In the world of pedagogy, in the world of teaching and learning, when we talk about the feedback loop, we're talking about ensuring that students are regularly receiving, reflecting on, and internalizing feedback that is for their learning. All right? And by doing this, we're accomplishing a lot. Most importantly, we are motivating and inspiring learning, right? When students see that you care, that you're paying attention, and when students are getting some valuable insights on what they need to continue doing and what they need to start doing, this is uh, a source of motivation. So that's one of the positive outcomes of providing timely feedback. Feedback can also support a student's sense of accountability and self-efficacy. It can build their confidence, right? And it also, again, reinforces the reality that you care about what they're doing, right? And you're being attentive to their performance. Feedback can also lead students to the appropriate supports, right? So as faculty, sometimes there's only so much that we can do. But we may be aware of certain resources or certain services at the college that students can benefit from. So based on what we're seeing in their performance, based on whether they're demonstrating their outcomes, Right, we can then point students to valuable resources and supports that can aid them in their learning. And then of course, by using feedback as an opportunity to connect and facilitate dialogue with students, we are reinforcing relationships and we're building a sense of community. Right? And when we put all these things together, right, we are, um, again, supporting a sense of autonomy, competence and relatedness, all of which are part of that self-determination theory uh, which is there to guide us in our motivation of students. So that's an interesting theoretical framework to explore further if you're interested in further reading on the importance of motivating students. The reality, however, is that it's difficult to maintain that feedback loop. There are a lot of potential barriers that keep us from or keep students from receiving feedback in a timely and effective way. So in the live workshop, I typically go to Mentimeter at this point to ask faculty, in your experience, what often impedes the feedback loop? So I'm gonna invite you, the viewer, to think about this. And again, you can pause the video if you wanna reflect on this a little bit more deeply. Whoops. What I'm gonna do right now is I'm actually gonna slide over into Mentimeter to show you some of the results that appeared during my last live facilitation of this workshop. When I ask faculty what typically impedes the feedback loop between faculty and students, these are the kinds of responses that they generated. Being dismissive, so maybe students aren't necessarily recognizing the value of that feedback that's part of their assignment or part of their learning experience. There may be language barriers and students may not necessarily understand what's actually coming across when we write feedback. Students might disagree 
And if the students feel as though we're inaccurate in our feedback, they may be less likely to really engage with that feedback. There's also the matter of time. Providing feedback can take time, especially if we're providing a lot of written feedback. And time, of course, is a finite resource. So that can be a barrier. Same thing goes for students. Students have busy lives. They have competing priorities. And with all that, they may be struggling to find opportunities to really read and internalize and reflect on the feedback that faculty are offering. All right, so these are all potential barriers to the feedback loop. And sometimes it's technology too, right? The student may not necessarily know how to use the learning management system, or if we're using track changes and comments, they might need a bit of guidance. They might need a bit of a tutorial in just understanding how to access, right, that feedback that we're sharing. So these are things to keep in mind. Having said all of that, here are some of the challenges that students have experienced. There isn't a lot of literature out there that's dedicated to exploring feedback, right, as a pedagogical mechanism. But one interesting resource I came across was written by Burke and Peterick in 2010. It is referenced at the end of the slide deck. And they go as far as identifying some of the common complaints that students make when receiving feedback from faculty. So students can become frustrated when they can't read the comments, when it takes too long to get them if they're not timely, if the comments are brief or too vague, if the comments don't lead them anywhere, right? If they don't see a clear connection between the comments and the grade, if the feedback is confusing or conflicting, if the feedback seems judgmental, right? And comments on the student's attitudes or efforts that aren't true. That can obviously compromise a student's perception of the faculty. It can compromise the relationship between students and faculty. Um, so these two are considerations that we want to make when asking ourselves how much feedback, you know, what type of feedback, what's going to be useful to our students. So keep in mind that, yes, there are barriers to the feedback loop. And with that, we sometimes have to schedule time for creating feedback. We have to find efficiencies so that it's not too time consuming when we're creating that feedback. And we also, do our want, we also want to do our best to be timely so that there isn't too much time between the assignment and when the feedback arrives. All right. So let's look now at some more specific strategies to actually support the delivery of feedback. So one thing we can do is create touch points where students are receiving feedback on work that is in progress. In other words, we're not waiting until the assignment is completed and turned in to comment on the student work. We're giving them comments along the way, redirecting them and supporting them at the times that they need it most. Now, of course, it can be difficult to reach every student, especially when we have busy semesters with large sections. So one thing we might consider doing is offering or creating opportunities for structured peer feedback to be used. What do I mean by structured feedback? Well, what I mean is that students will need to be prompted, right? Creating some kind of a template or a list of questions for students to respond to that are related to the actual evaluation criteria of the assignment. That can be an especially effective way for students to generate peer feedback for each other. All right, encourage students to be honest, but encourage them also to be constructive, to be respectful, right? They might submit the feedback to you for review before you actually distribute it back to the students themselves. You can go about this in different ways, but this is one way that more feedback can be generated from the full academic community and not only from you. Some faculty will go as far as actually encouraging students to mark each other's work using the evaluation tool or the rubric, you know, that is associated with the assignment. That might or might not be an effective strategy, depending on how complicated the rubric is. Students might struggle just with that piece, right, the ability to interpret the rubric, and that's another piece into it, unto itself. So what I would find especially helpful here is to just give students, you know, three to five to seven or so structured prompts so that they can comment on each other's work. Things that are clear, things that are relatable, and things that are linked to the assignment criteria. 
Another strategy that we might employ is to ask students to reflect on the feedback that they've received. So, as was noted earlier, one of the common barriers to the feedback loop is that students simply aren't investing the time in reading it and interpreting it. But what if we facilitate some kind of an opportunity, some kind of an incentive for them to do exactly that, right? So we might set up something on the course shell online where students are asked to reflect on the feedback that they received. And they might conduct this reflection in writing or through an audio file or through video. It's something that they might share with a group or it's something that they might share with you directly if you feel as though it's more appropriate for students to keep that kind of reflection to themselves. Um, and this activity can in turn be rolled in to the evaluation criteria of the assignment. So maybe this final step actually constitutes five to 10% of the assignment grade. This is a great way to inspire students to actually read the feedback, reflect on it, respond to it, then it actually becomes a formative tool as opposed to something that they can easily dismiss. Another strategy is to create a discussion forum wherein students can share their stop, start, continue strategy for the next assignment. So based on how they scored, based on how they perceive their own performance, based on the feedback they received, they can identify something that they need to stop doing, something that isn't working, something that wasn't in the service of their learning or their product, right? What do they need to remove? That's the stop piece. The start piece is something that they can begin doing, something that was missing from the previous task that they intend to bring in in the future, according to the feedback or the reflections that they've conducted. And then finally, something to continue, something that worked well, something that they want to obviously uh, continue to do to ensure a successful performance. So that's a template that works well. And we have a post on our faculty learning hub that actually breaks down this strategy in a little more detail and includes a printable or downloadable template that you can actually use in your practice. You might also invite students to follow up during virtual office hours to ask questions and seek clarifications, right? So if you are hosting drop-in sessions on Zoom or Teams or whatever platform is comfortable for you, um, remind students that they have the ability to stop in, right, ask questions, get clarifications, and ensure that they are indeed um, understanding and able to apply the feedback that you've created for them. Maybe there's other strategies that you've used as well. And again, if you come to one of our live sessions on this topic, I'll look forward to hearing from you so that we can expand on this list. So one useful guiding principle to keep in mind when articulating your feedback is the need to feed forward. Again, I'm going to share with you something that comes from this Burke and Peterick resource. And I think they've articulated this idea of feeding forward really beautifully. They claim that the view held by many students that feedback on a task is specific to that task and has no relevance to any other learning has been identified by many as a major obstacle to students acting on feedback. Such students hold a literal understanding of the term feedback as backward looking comments on what they have achieved in past assessments. To uncap the formative potential of such comments, even on summative assessments, it is necessary to develop a new understanding of feedback, which is freed from its retrospective spatial location. This makes it possible for comments to inform students on their present and future learning by feeding forward and continuing to shape the student learning journey. So when students recognize that the feedback that you're providing isn't just a comment of, on what was, it is a commentary on what will be. These are recommendations that are guiding them on subsequent and future assessments and learning experiences. When we explain it in that way, right? I think students are more likely to see the value, more likely to buy into the benefits of actually spending some time with their feedback. So we want to make that point and make that clear to students so that they do invest the time in seeing our feedback and engaging in this dialogue. Other guiding principles to take into consideration as well. It's always important to acknowledge students' efforts and positive contributions. Even if they've missed the mark and even if they've demonstrated some, you know, some weaknesses, um, and miss some outcomes on a particular assignment. We want to acknowledge those things that they have done well. Again, this comes back to the continue piece of the stop, start, continue model. 
And this is a great way, again, to reinforce relationship, relationships and trust with students. By doing this, we're reinforcing the growth mindset as well. Now, the growth mindset isn't only about positive, you know, and reinforcing or reassuring comments, right? It's also about challenging and encouraging students to continually improve. So the whole idea is that, yeah, you know, maybe there were some things missing. Maybe there is some opportunity for growth, but you will get there, right? And you can get there by taking these things into consideration, consulting these resources, accessing these services, whatever it may be. Right, and the whole idea is that we are trying to foster and inspire continual personal improvement. It's not about competing with other students, right? It is about being better than you were yesterday. So that's an important perspective to bring um, into our feedback. Um, Linda Nilsson also recommends that we confine negative comments to the particular performance and not to the performer. So when it does become necessary to give constructive or critical feedback to students, remember, let's make it about the performance. Let's not make it personal, right? So this is an evidence-based approach. Based on what I see, this is what's missing, or these are my recommendations. It's not about making a personal judgment against the individual themselves. This can be especially important when working with students who are from cultures that value high context or indirect approaches to communication. In many of our cultural workshops, we talk about communication styles, cultural dimensions, et cetera. And I mean, we can use Canada as an example. Canada is a country that values direct communication in that we encourage folks to stay on topic, you know, don't waste words, take a linear approach to your communication style. However, we are very indirect when it comes to giving critical feedback. Feedback in Canada can be a bit of an elaborate dance. You know, some folks like to use things like the feedback sandwich or the two to glow on and one to grow on strategy so that there's more of an emphasis on positive comments than there is on constructive comments. This is not a bad place to start with our students, right? Because it is kind of a polite and a, a, a lighthearted way of approaching feedback. But if students come back to us and say, hey, you know, I'd actually prefer that you be more direct and more upfront about your constructive feedback, then we should honor that. But we must be cautious. I wouldn't advise starting there, knowing that many of our students do come from cultures that value a more indirect approach to constructive feedback and communication. So we've talked a little bit now about general approaches to articulating and creating feedback for students. Let's get to the how. What kinds of tools might we use to actually deliver this feedback to students in a remote context? What you're seeing on this slide is a breakdown of some different tools that involve minimal technology, or at least very little new technology, some technology that might include some functions that maybe you haven't used before, and some new technology, right? Tools that aren't as commonly used as some of the others identified here, but are still really valuable and straightforward. So I'm gonna start at the top. I think the most intuitive place to start is just by making sure that our evaluation tools are integrated into Econ Astoga, right? And that we're treating them not only as vehicles to share grades with students, but as vehicles to share feedback as well. So if you have a rubric or a grading scheme that's associated with an assignment in Econ Astoga, be sure to add comments to that because that's one place that students will intuitively go. The other possibility is to reach out to students directly using their course mail. So this is now integrated with Outlook. So by that, I mean, if you send a student a message via Econostoga, it should also go directly to their student Outlook account. Remember, anytime you're corresponding with students at the college, you wanna to stick to those official channels uh, that the college asks us to use, right? So it's either our official Outlook or Econostoga. So if you do see something urgent, if a student has struggled with something, if they've missed an assignment or two, right, um, it's never a bad idea to connect with them directly so that you know and can confidently ensure that they are receiving that feedback. So those are some simple, you know, low-tech solutions to start with. Bringing in a little more technology. If you are have stu having students submit assignments in a PDF format, or in an Office 365 format. So whether that's Word, PowerPoint, Excel, or whatever, 
you have the ability to add changes, excuse me, track changes, comments, and markups directly within those documents. Most folks are aware of the fact that we can do this in programs like Word, but sometimes people overlook the fact that we can do this in PDF documents and other types of files as well. So that is absolutely possible. And we have some links to some tutorials uh, to these kinds of functions provided below this video. Another really interesting tool that you can use in Econostoga is um, creating audio or video clips directly within the feedback section that's associated with a rubric or an evaluation tool. So as opposed to simply writing your summative feedback at the end of an assignment, you have the ability to add a little bit of yourself. You can actually record your, yourself um, just using your microphone, or you can record a video that can in turn be made accessible by turning on auto captioning. And this is a great way of, you know, getting across more than just the text, right? Sharing your tone, sharing your demeanor, sharing your attitude with students, because sometimes that gets lost in the feedback as well. So for example, if you are, you know, wanting to give a student a little bit of constructive feedback, but you're worried about how that feedback will be received, it might be helpful to do it in a video format so that you can modify your tone. You know, students have the opportunity to see you. They won't misread that feedback. Um, and again, it's bringing more of a human element to the remote environment. And it may ultimately save you some time as well. So that is something that you can do directly in Econostoga, and we have a tutorial demonstrating on how that can be done um, below this video as well. Finally, there are other tools that maybe you haven't considered before. For example, Vocaroo. Vocaroo is a third-party app. Currently, it's freely available on the web, and what's interesting about it is that it allows you to record feedback or record comments for students. Um, so it's an audio format but what it produces is a transferable link so unlike the audio feature in econostoga that must live in econostoga if you record yourself on vocaroo you have the ability to take that link and embed it anywhere right so you can record and embed audio feedback that can in turn be pasted into an office 365 document or an email etc um, so this is another audio tool that offers you the added flexibility of sharing that audio just about anywhere. And then there's also this whole sort of self-grading option. We can create self-graded quizzes in Econostoga. We can also do it in Microsoft Forms. This in, can in turn be used as a mechanism for students, right, to test their knowledge and get some immediate feedback on whether or not they are indeed comprehending and internalizing the content that you are sharing in your course. Um, and it's a great, way that you can collect feedback from students because again feedback is a two-way street it's not only about imparting feedback an important part of our role is to collect feedback from students just so we can get a general sense as to where they're at and how they're doing so creating a survey on microsoft forms is a great way to facilitate that right we might also use it as more of a uh, a teaching tool where again students are completing some kind of a quiz or a survey at the end of a unit the end of a chapter um, that in turn can be self-graded and gives them some immediate indication as to how they're doing. All right. So everything that you're seeing here um, has a corresponding tutorial provided at the bottom of this video, with the exception of using basic rubrics, et cetera, in Econostoga. If you are new to doing things like using Vocaroo, creating a self-graded quiz or a survey on Microsoft Forms, adding sticky notes to PDFs or Office 365 documents, or creating recorded video or audio feedback on Econostoga, have a look down below, click on some of those different links and explore. And in fact, that's what I would encourage you to do next. All right, and ask yourself, what might work for you? So using the links, explore these options and get a sense as to what might be applicable. And who knows, maybe you'll be able to build your repertoire of tools that can be used to deliver feedback remotely.
Another important step to take when giving feedback to students is to direct them to helpful resources at the college. And our student success services area is fully operational even when we're working remotely. So you see the link here on the screen and you see some of the services that can be provided to students. Sharing this link with them or directing them to the self-referral form that's available on their Econostoga course shell Right on the home page, underneath the announcements, you'll notice there's a button there that says need help, and that will take you to the Student Success Services referral form. That's a great place to direct students if you feel as though they would benefit from any of the services here, whether it's academic, personal, financial, et cetera. So encourage students to utilize these great services that are available to them. All right, to conclude today's video presentation, I'm going to just end by going back to that list that we looked at the beginning of the session. All right, so let's return to that, not a mind map, but list of items that faculty refer to as ways that they would typically deliver feedback to students in a live environment. So we talked about the value of using things like email, polling apps, rubrics. It seems that most of these things are still usable in a remote environment, but we might expand on this list in light of some of the different options, options that we've discussed today. So remember, we've got some video tutorials linked below this video that you can explore further. Ask yourself, what other options might you add to this list, right? As opposed to just adding written feedback to a rubric, maybe you'll take the extra step of creating a video or an audio file that students can access on Econostoga. And if we're using notes and markups in assignments, maybe we can use more fully the markup tools that are available in Office 365 and in PDF documents. You might also consider creating a self-grading quiz, right? Um, using Microsoft Forms or Econostoga, that too can be a great formative tool for students. And maybe there's other strategies that I haven't identified in this workshop that you'd like to share. Feel free to add comments below the video so that I can then in turn add those recommendations to future iterations of this live workshop. Here are our references that were used today. And at this point, I just want to say thank you so much for spending the time to watch this video. Remember, you can visit our schedule link below the video to learn more about other workshops that will be offered live in the future. And I look forward to seeing you there. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great summer. I'll talk to you soon.